Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Yes. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I can see the um the attendance is is increasing. I was scared at first. I've been here for a while and. We just seven or eight of us. So while everyone is joining, um, a quick introduction. I am Hussein Mahadi, and um, I'm the moderator for today's session. As we all know, the topic for today is African continental free trade area, and we have three mentors um that will be with us today. Um, And someone is on the page. He's standing with himself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have three mentors for today's session, and um, I can't see any of our mentors yet, but hopefully they'll be joining us very, very soon. So quickly before we start the session for today, I will quickly read um the mentors profile. But before I do that, let's just take a little icebreaker. I can see we are 24 mentees in the call. Um, Atta Solomon Bendega, nice to see you. Um, Solomon was one of our alumni from 2023, fourth quarter, if I'm correct. Nice to see you. I can see Joma, Oin Kansola, Akinta, Vivian, Judah, Victoria, and Wafo. So on a random, I would call um, any of the mentee and um, I'll be asking you a few questions about how um, the GFC mentorship and internship program has been so far for you. Um, this is week, is it week seven or, or six? Week six. Okay, week six, uh, thank you very much. So this is week six, what have you learned so far? Um, I believe you've learned a lot, so you can just share a few things you've learned um, so far in the program with us. Um, as you all know, you are you will be writing exams soon, so I believe this is something that um, is already on your mind. So I will call on um, Dara, I can see Dara on the call. So Dara, you can unmute yourself, Turn on your video, um, tell us what um, course you are taking on the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program and so far, um, what you've learned. Okay, one of our mentors is on the call. Um, thanks for joining us today. Dara, are you there? Okay, Dara is not responding. Uh, let me call on Judah Shaba. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Judah. I can't see your video. Um, Judah, I still can't hear you. I don't know if anyone else can hear Judah. I can't okay. hear you. So my name is the course on artificial intelligence and technology. Okay. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. I think your network is, is breaking. Yeah, my network is now. not good. Okay, I said I'm taking a course, the course on artificial intelligence and technology. Okay. So, so far... I've learned quite a lot from ranging from um, AI for good, AI for bad, and the various legislations guiding um, the use of AI. Though a lot are still in process, and uh, governments are different. Governments are working on it, and also um, I've learned um, basically <laughs> the use of AI. Yeah. That we can right. and also monitor our data, the type of information we give out online, things that can be accessed by AI and all that. 
So that's my little story. All right. Thank you very much, um, Judas Sharma. Unfortunately, yeah. we couldn't see your face. Um, thank you for giving us a, a little <laughs> summary of um, how the AI session has been so far. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope it was very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll be calling on um, two more people on a random um, before we jump into the, the, the program for today. Just tell us how um, the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship program has been for you so far. Tell us um, the course you are taking and maybe probably um, your best mentor so far. So I can see um, Wina O. Wina. Wina O. Aye Bomwa. Sorry, I, I can't pronounce that correctly. Okay, Miss Eberwe Chuku Ezekiel is on the call. Good morning, Ma, and welcome to um, the Gypsy Mentorship and Internship Program session today um, on EFCFTA. Um, we are so delighted to have you here with us today. So I called on I called on someone, Wina. Oh, Wina is not responding. Um quickly, I would also call on um should I pick? Okay, I can see Uju on the call. Uju, you can go next. I hope you've been following us. Yeah, good morning. Okay, good morning, Uju. Okay, so I'm taking the course on health technology law. And mm -hmm. so far, the course has been good. We've learned a lot. We've learned on medical ethics. We've learned medical malpractice. We've learned like the rights that patients have. And um, we've learned a lot. Business, health business, health tourism, and um, how telemedicine has helped us. And um, one problem that the health um, section is facing is how they lack revenues from, like support and revenues from the government. And so far my best mentor has been Mr. Ebenezer. So it has been a very, very interesting program. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Uju. Um, I'll be calling on one last person to tell us how um, the GFC mentorship and internship program has been for you so far. Um, quickly before we jump into the business for today. So I can see Princess, um, Haria Highness, Princess Oria Rebu is on the call. So Princess, you can you can go next. Oh, Princess is teaching us. I will call on someone else. We don't have so much time. So I can see Zina to Zina to Ahmad. Zina to Ahmad, please go next. Wow, Zinatu, Zinatu is, I can't hear you, Zinatu. I can see you are unmuted and your video is on. Who should I call next? Okay, Ephraim, Ephraim Azaria. Please, let's make it snappy. Ephraim is now responding. Okay, I can see Ephraim just unmuted yourself. Okay, Ephraim, we just saw you and you just ran away. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Ephraim. Have you been following us? Yes, yes. Yes, I've okay. been on a um, alternative dispute resolution group. Okay. And so far, it has been so interesting. All right. The thing has been catching my eyes, and a lot has been happening that make me to realize. I've not made the wrong choice, especially in mediation and arbitration processes. I'm so much interested and I thank God for the mentors that I have so far. I don't know which who among them will I even say is the better. Mm. In fact, all of them, all of all the sessions I have attended to, 
were well explained. The arbitration process, laws, guiding the processes, and all other stuff I can't even explain. In fact, this has been a wonderful blessing for me. All right, thank you very much, Ephraim, and um, every other person that I called. Um, I, I believe if we want to keep going on, um, we'll get so much exciting testimonials from um, all our mentees across all the courses. But um, for now, we'll stop there and just read out our mentor's profile for today and um, kick off on the topic, African Continental Free Trade Area. So our first mentor for today, Mrs. Ebewe Chuku. Mrs. Ebewe Chuku Ezike. Ezike, I don't know if I pronounced it right, I'm sorry. So Ms. Ebewe Chuku Ezike is an intra-Africa trade advocate, chartered mediator and a corporate and commercial lawyer at G, alias a leading business law firm in Nigeria. She is the founder of ASCFTA Dialogue, an organization dedicated to creating awareness and promotion and understanding of the AFCFTA through meaningful discussion and knowledge sharing. Ebere Chuku is also a member of the African Continental Free Trade Area Youth Advisory Council and an alumna of reputable institutions such as the African Exports Imports Bank, Afriexim Bank Academy, Trade Law Center South Africa and the Future Female Business School South Africa and the International Trade Center SME Ad Academy Geneva. Aside her professional um, pursuits, Ebere Chuku is a member of the Global Shepa Community, an initiative of the World Economic Forum, and has several and has served as the curator of the Ibadan Hub where she led the hub in championing um, courses towards the empowerment of micro, small, and medium sized enterprises, MSMEs, and protecting the environment through eco friendly practices. Ibarishiku holds an exceptional academic background, having graduated with first class honors in law from the University of Ibadan and the Nigerian Law School. She holds an LLM degree from the University of Ibadan and is currently the Secretary of the International Trade Law Committee of the Nigerian Bar Association Section on Business Law, NBA, SPL. Um, awesome, awesome profile. Thanks for joining us today, Ms. Eberi Chuku. I'll be so happy to have you here. I'm look forward to learning so much from your vast experience and um, knowledge. Um, our next mentor for today is Omobola Adekola. Omobola is the managing partner of Campion and Broly Solicitors and the founder of TWB Trade Advisory Limited. She has extensive experience in handling corporate and commercial transactions. Having provided transactional advisory service to a diverse range of clients over the years, she advised institutions on corporate structure of business, cross-border instruments, international trade, corporate governance, best practices, and legal intricacies of financial matters. She is the founder and host of the Trade, Trading Without Border podcast, a podcast on um, African continental free trade area. Mobola was part of a team of corporate governance compliance professionals that advised the Nigerian government on policy framework for private sector implementation of the National Ethics and Integrity Policy 2020. She is a member of the Executive Committee of the Young Directors Forum, YDF, of the Chartered Institute of Directors, Nigeria. She serves as a faculty and volunteer legal consultant for free for Faith Foundation. Mobola is a graduate of Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife, Nigeria, and was called to the Nigerian Bar in 2007. She holds a postgraduate degree in international trade and commercial law, LLM Durban University, Durban, United Kingdom. 
in has played an umbrella partakes in charitable activities. Um, you can all join me in welcoming our both mentors have already read their profile on the chat box. Let me see our excitement. We are so excited to have them on the call with us. Oh, sorry. I mistakenly stopped sharing my screen. And uh, lastly, um, our last but not the least mentor for today is Kanatsiwa Gambuza from um, Zimbabwe. Tanasiwa Dambuza is passionate um, monitoring and evaluation experts with a demonstrated history of working in media, international trade and development industry. He has a master's degree in international trade and diplomacy and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Zimbabwe. He also has a certificate in advanced radio, radio sorry, from Wits University. He is, a, he is co-founder of the Zimbabwe Institute of African Integration, a platform that aims to promote and support the implementation of the African continental free trade area in Zimbabwe and beyond. He is a graduate research assistant at Glen Consultancy, where he conducts and supports research on various aspects of trade and development. Previously, he worked as a research associate at Zimbabwe Cross Border Trade Association and as a call center agent at Econet Wireless Zimbabwe. He has skills and knowledge in diplomacy, international trade, marketing, brand awareness, political science, media development, freedom of expression, media literacy, media diversity, media sustainability, and media advocacy. He is also an enthusiast, advo enthusiastic advocate for the AFCFTA and its potentials to revolutionize intra-Africa trade and development. He attends the AFCFTA Business Forum 2023 in Cape Town and learned a lot about AFCFT from um, various stakeholders and experts. He has also published several articles on AFCFT related topics on Business Times, Zimbabwe, um, Global South Opportunities, and other platforms where he shared his insights and opinion on AFCFTA. Thank you so, so much um, for joining us, all our mentors for today. Um, quickly, I will be jumping into calling our first presenter from the mentees. And before we jump, uh, call on our mentors to um, give us a whole, a whole broad view of the, of the topic for today. So I believe our presenter is ready to go now. Rahma Oyedeji, your baby is crying on the call. Please, you can mute yourself. Thank you. Who is our presenter for today? We don't have so much time. Please, you can step in right now. Do we have a presenter, a backup presenter? Hello, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Bobby. Yeah, good morning, Bobby. Yeah, um, I'll be presenting for group one. Give me a second, let me share my screen. So, if I proceed. A minute, please. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm having some difficulties sharing the PowerPoint. Okay, well, uh, okay, if you're having some difficulties sharing the PowerPoint, I think you can start off um, without your PowerPoints. Let's see how we can help you share uh, your screen from our end. So you can just start off. We don't really have too much time. Yeah. Okay. 
So my name is Bobby Shalom. I'll be waiting for and then the aims of AFC, FTA. Then we'll look at some of the difficulties and then we'll provide some little solutions to the difficulty. Then we'll run it up by this FTA. <clears throat> so the African continental free trade area is a free trade zone that was established in 2018, but became fully operational in January 2021. It was founded by an agreement between the 54 African Union countries. And so by the number of its participants, it is the second largest free trade zone in the world, coming second behind World Trade Organization. The AFC FTA headquarters is being hosted by Ghana. And so what are the aims of AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade <clears throat> Area? From the name is to boost the African economy to get, um, to get African in trading in an atmosphere whereby there is little or no restriction. And so to, to, to also help African countries assess the world market. So the uh, and also the African to have a common ground, so that it is is going to have um, a free trade within the continent. Of course, to also enhance economic diversifications and the likes. So from the from the World Bank, it is estimated that by twenty thirty five if the agreement and then the participant contract committed to their agreements that the AFCFTA will generate an income of 450 billion and then increase trade exports by its 1% from the, yeah, the, 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 from the AFCFTA charts, it is expected by 2050, they, 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 they reach an income of 29 trillion dollar within the continent and so the united nations economic commission sat down and saw to this uh, agreement that if actually they stick to their strategy and then they remove all these barriers faced between the african <clears throat> the african countries in terms of trade it is achievable however as we know um there are, there will always be difficulties First of all, because of the nature of Africa, because of our culture, it has made it a kind of difficult for women and youths to be so much involved. And also, we still have high cost and tariff barriers between, still existing between these African countries. And so it has, it has limited the, um, the AFCFT to actually achieve her goals to a particular extent. Of course, corruption, which is arguably synonymous to Africa, a difficult to achieve the agreement or AFCFTA. Yeah. Okay, so what are some of these solutions? Number one, the Africans, we need to improve financial literacy and access to capital. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we feel Africa money is an issue, but actually money is not the issue. The literacy, the, the, the financial know-how has been the barrier. So there has to be a, a financial literacy campaign and also uh, giving, uh, so, so that people will have access to, to capital. We also need financial awareness. We also need to, to have um, an all-inclusive participation atmosphere so that the youth and the women will also be involved in so in much in the AFCFTA plans and strategy. We also have to be neutral and we have to be you have to have a neutral-based initiation 
such that our government, every government of these participating states will be fully involved. If one, but if, if some government are fully involved and the others are not, we kind of have um, still a barrier that will limit the access of FCFTA. And then one, one most important thing is that there is a need for harmonizing of policies on e-commerce by these states. Because when we have different policies, it becomes even a barrier, even when we are willing to trade between the African continent. Now, as of January 2021, we have 54 African countries who are part of the African Union as members of AFCFTA. Now, while these people have, have signed um, this agreement, not all of them have um, gone to ratify it individually in, in their countries. And so without such ratification, even when the, the heads of the government have signed to be committed to FCFTA her goals and objectives, there's still also um, limited participation of such countries. So as, as you can see, oh, from our slide, sorry, if you are able to get it, you'll see we have 54 African countries. Nigeria is one of it, Angola, Benin, Kenya, Lesotho, and the rest. This in summary is what we able to, we, we have for us this morning for our presentation on behalf of group one. Thank you. All right, um, Prof. Shalom, thank you very much um, for that wonderful top-notch presentation on behalf of your group. Um, it was very brief and um, very, very informative. I'll leave um, the rest of the comments to our mentors to, to do that and also to broaden our knowledge on EFCFTA, which is the subject matter for today. So without wasting much of our time, I'll be calling on our first mentor for today, Ms. Ebewe Chuku Izike. Um, it's over to you now. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, louder. we can yes. hear you. All right, great. So thank you, JIIPCT, for inviting me. Um, Thank you. Okay, we're trying to set my camera up. All right, and that was um, such a good presentation. Hi, Omobola and Fanato. I can see my my people are present as well. So I trust that this is going to be a very interesting, rich and robust conversation as well. Okay, so um great presentation on what the AFCFTA entails. I will just also be um briefly giving an overview um, and of course I believe that my colleagues present would also you know expand from wherever I stop or just sort of buttress what um, this is about. So um, I would just want to start from some of the things I noted from your presentation. I think one of the things you mentioned was that the AFCFTA became fully operational in 2021 well, the agreement actually itself became operational in 2019. That is after it was it came into force, so it's um it became operational in 2019. Um, by being operational, it means that the required number of countries um needed to ratify the agreement, ratified it, and so that's um that's provided for in the agreement. I think about 24 countries have deposited here instrument of ratification before it can come into force. So coming into force makes it operational. So it became operational in 2019. However, trading did not start until 2022 under the guided trade initiative. I know online you would see um, things like trading officially started in 2021, but trading actually started in 2022 under the guided trade initiative. And I'll um, talk about that later. So. What was the thought about the ASCFTA? Why is it important? Why should we be talking about it? Well, the ASCFTA is 
the African continental free trade area, which has already been mentioned by by um, the presenter. It is the largest trading block by participating countries. I, I know the presenter mentioned largest trading block, but not just the largest. There's a qualification to, the, to it being the largest. So it's the largest by participating countries. Other, other trading blocks like the EU, they are large in terms of GDP, but the AFCFT is the largest by you know participating countries. About 54 countries came together and agreed that okay, we are going to set up an agreement to monitor or to to um what's the word now to control or to regulate, regulate, to regulate how we relate with one another. That is one I mean relate with one another. I'm talking about trade, to regulate trade relations among ourselves. So, 54 African countries were um, ad, uh, came together to adopt the agreement, but so far about 47 of them ratified it. And the the presenter was talking about the difference between talking about the importance of ratification because when you ratify the agreement, it's you it, you it becomes binding for you. But as a, as a country, you're able to participate and you know just get the old benefits of being a part of the agreement. So it's a free trade area. And I think we also need to start from what exactly a free trade area is. So a free trade area is like an agreement that um um you know by countries really by countries, group of countries come together and they agree that they would eliminate trading barriers. So barriers to trade can be tariff and non-tariff. So tariff barriers are monetary, they are like duties or taxes imposed on goods being imported to a country. So the, the the country receiving or importing those goods impose those tariffs, those um duties. They are called tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Uh, basically non-monetary barriers. They include things like um, you know, maybe standards. Well, standard is more like a measure, but it can become a barrier when there is no harmonization of standard. So they also non-tariff barriers can also include quota restrictions, quota restrictions as well. And um, quota is just like a restriction. When a country says, for instance, you cannot bring more than this number of goods or more than this amount of goods monetary wise into my country. So it's a free trade area and um, it is important because one thing it does for us as Africans is that it will boost the level of trade among African countries, which is currently at... Um, less than 15 percent really low unlike other other continents like the latin american ties like asia that has about 50 or something percent there about so let's let's talk a bit about the origin of the afcft the afcft is not a new idea the issue of um integration is as old as time you know africans coming together and saying they want to you know grow economically we want to become more united and, you know, this reflecting in our agreements when agreements we enter into one another. So let, let me start from 2012 when the, during the 18th session of the assemblies of the African Union, the assemblies of aid of state and governments, basically your country leaders, you know, they make up the African Union. They came together and adopted a decision to establish the African continental free trade area. And in 2018, the AFCFTA, you know, was signed, came into force in 2019. So it started in 2022, and currently the AFCFTA has about eight protocols. So the protocols that are currently in force are the trading goods protocol, the trading services, and the protocol on dispute resolution. So the other protocols are the competition intellectual property rights, investments, and those ones were adopted last year. And two more protocols were adopted this year, and that's the protocol on women and youth in trade and digital trade. So protocols, the yeah, agreements as well, yeah, documents. And, you know, just like the AFCFTA, um, the old point of ratification also applies to the protocol, but it also must be ratified in getting a particular number of persons or countries that must ratify it before it comes into force as well. This is provided in in the agreement. So you can check the uh, agreement text. I assume you guys are all lawyers, eh? Are you all lawyers? 
or is it law students or we are not all lawyers we are not all lawyers um we oh okay no okay um, this is a combined oh, great. of all the courses that okay so that's going to be talking about like health law courses. Dispute resolution, it is this. I just assume that maybe you're all lawyers. Okay, but there is an agreement that governs this whole thing we're talking about. That's the AFCFT, the agreement establishing the AFCFT. The treaty is on the African Union website. If you just Google the AFCFT agreement, you would you would see it and you can read it. There are also a lot of articles right up, you know, about this whole thing, and then you can always go there and check online to just you know be informed you know? so this is a good platform for you to also learn about the agreement which you're currently doing now so what's the what's the big deal about the ASCFT? so i have here that okay the largest payment block i talked about that by participating number of countries it combines a gdp of about 3.4 trillion usd and a population of about 1.3 billion people and it's like the first time that African leaders will come together and make a declaration that they want to, you know, take ownership of their economic development as a continent. It is poised to boost intra-African trade if successfully implemented. According to UNCTAD, that's the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. So the AFCFTA can boost intra-African trade by 33% and can reduce African trade deficit by 51%. So it could also boost African contribution to global trade, which is currently less than 5%. So global trade, Africa contributes less than 5%, and the AFCFT can boost Africa's contribution to global trade. So, but it's full, it's also its full implementation can boost Africa's real income gains by nearly 415 billion, 450 billion dollars. At least 40 million people out of extreme poverty by 2035. This is World Bank statistics. And of course, it's an opportunity to transform MSMEs, that's the micro, small, medium enterprises, from the sidelines into the frontiers of international trade. It's an opportunity for them to grow. It is a positive step towards the economic integration of the African continent. I will talk more about this. And it can be a tool for women and youth empowerment. Thanks to the protocol on women and youth in trade, which um highlights how women can you know take advantage of of, of trade under the AFCFT and you know bans or condemns discrimination against women against young persons in trade. So the AFCFT can be a tool for women and youth empowerment. And um, let's talk about the why is the AFCFT a positive step towards the, the economic integration of the African continent. So uh, if you look at the agreement, I'm just going to check the objectives of the AFCFTA. Now, okay. All right, so the AFCFTA, if you go to the treaty, that's the text that establishes the, uh, the African continental free trade area. There are general and specific objectives. So, you know, one of the objectives of the AFCFT is to lay the foundation for the establishment of a continental customs union at a later stage. So the whole point of African integration is enshrined in the Agenda 26, 2063 or Agenda 63 of the African Union, which is talking about an integrated and prosperous Africa. Um, Looking at the objective, so an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, and the AFCFTA can, you know, achieve that vision when you're talking about economic integration. Of course, economic integration, more trade among African countries will lead to prosperity, and then ultimately peace. So, the AFCFTA lays the foundation for the establishment of a continental customs union at a later stage. There are different levels of integration and the free trade area is just the lowest level of integration. So the whole point is to get to a higher level of integration where there is free movement of persons, you know, no barriers to trade. And we just have one, you know, one front, like the, just like the EU. You understand how the EU operates. It's not the EU operates. When the EU enters into trade agreements, they, they enter on behalf of their member countries. 
So just like the EU, the AFCFT, there is that plan that African Union or that vision that one day we'll get to that kind of integration, that very high integration. Maybe we'll be able to use one currency, become a monetary union, an economic union. And this is the foundation. So it is a step towards a really, really long journey. It's called 2063 for a reason. So there are lots of them, foundation blocks, you know, being put in place. And at the same time, as these blocks are being put in place, you can also see challenges. Some of the challenges we talked about, uh, you know, some of you guys and uh, one of you presented today, talking about some of these challenges and also the importance of, you know, literacy, educating people on what these agreements mean, and of course, financial literacy as well. So let's look at um, so far what has been done or I would just call it the wings of the of the AFCFT. We talked about the fact that this was the 2012 idea. Um, but then in 2018, it was adopted, became operational, and then it's currently in force. So let's look at what exactly, you know, are the wings so far, what has been achieved. Thankfully, all the protocols that the African Union had in mind. So and negotiate has been negotiated, has been adopted. I mean, so far, we don't know if there are more protocols. Well, we have currently about eight. I don't know if they intend to do more protocols, but so far, all these protocols have been adopted and it's a win for, for the continent. Then, you also want to look at the guided trade initiatives that uh, started 2022. Another round um, should start this year or so. But even though the guided, the guided trade initiative presented um, some challenges in exporting among, okay, let me explain what guided trade initiative means. So it's an initiative of the, of the AFCFT Secretariat. Some countries came together and um, the whole point was to monitor exports and imports under the AFCFT. So it's guided because it's a controlled environment. It's, it's not like a full trade per se, but just to see select countries that will know, select countries that will participate in trading under the AFCFT and some of these countries were like Kenya, I think Egypt. And one thing about these um, countries, I think I noticed that we selected countries from different regions, so from West, South Africa, East Africa. And but there were challenges. That's one of the challenges where you know the, the custom officials not even know about the AFCFT, they didn't understand the tariffs and even the rules of origin as well. So there were just a lot of problems that surfaced. And of course, I think the whole point was to see how the AFCFT trading on that AFCFT will you know perform and then also to address some of the challenges as it, you know as it comes up. And of course, even without the guided trade initiatives, we, we know that other challenges like free movement of persons. One thing the AFCFT is supposed to do, or one of the objectives of the AFCFT, is to you know promote free movement of persons and capital. That's the all like that's very fundamental to integration, to economic integration. I'm just going to read it as it states here. And um, okay, I'm trying to read the agreement. They just confirmed that you can still hear me. I know I've been going on and on and on, and I didn't bother to check if I'm still audible. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, so the, the general objectives of the AFCFT one of the general objectives is to contribute to the movement of capital and natural persons and facilitate investments building on the initiatives and development of the state parties and the REPs. So the REPs are the regional economic communities like your ECOWAS, your um, SADEC, COMESA, you know, and the likes. So one of the objectives of the AFCFT is to promote free movement of persons, but we know how that is still like a problem in African countries, the lack of openness to allow to Africans, you know, it's just like um, this whole thing about visa restrictions, even the, you know, of friendliness when it comes to policies, foreign relations policies by governments. 
immigration policies and all. You know, somebody was talking about um was it not um I don't know one CNN official that was talking about how expensive it was for him to get you know a single entry visa to Nigeria you know from Kenya and then the whole thing about you know people complaining about thirteen countries not being very open to them when it comes to you know visa and all that. But we have the AU free movement of persons protocol, but that's only be adopted or is it ratified by four countries and it cannot come into force if it's not ratified by the required number of countries that should ratify. So this is one of the challenges that we are going to face, already facing a an obvious challenge that we will face in the implementation of the AFCFTA because the um if you the trading services protocol, you know, they have different levels of services and one of them has to do with movement of persons, also investment as well. You know, having to go into countries to invest for foreign direct event investment. So I want to leave that um my colleague will maybe want to shed more light on that. Well yeah, so the AFCFTA is is a good thing, it's a good development, but it will take a lot of political will. It will take a lot of buying into the integrated Africa vision. It will take a lot of enlightenment, you know, a lot of winning from, you know, maybe foreign um, manipulations or foreign control. It will, it will take a lot of investment, you know, a lot of investment money-wise. I know someone was talking about, you know, you know, finance, you know, trying to maybe say that finance may, may not really be a challenge for trade finance is a huge thing and it's a, it's a big deal for Africa. Finance is a big deal for Africa because a lot of African countries are indebted to foreign finance institutions, to foreign countries as well. So it will, it will take a lot of, you know, a lot of political, like I've, I've said, to, you know, see it come into, into, into force. But is it possible? I, I believe it's possible. It will take a lot of time because, like I said earlier, integration does not happen in a day. The European Union is an example of the whole process of integration. It takes time for integration to, you know, happen. But it's good that we are learning about it, you know, as Africans, as young Africans, and understanding, oh, what's my role in this? How can I push for participation from my own government? Because it's not a country, country level thing. At the continental level, you will see a lot of things happening, agreements, you know, being entered into. But ratification is a country level thing. Your country has to decide to ratify the agreement to be bound by it. So, you know, at this level, you can actually push for, you know, ratification and say, okay, we want, I want my country to be a part of this. Why my country not ratify this? What should my country do? What are the implementation strategies that is currently being carried out in my country and how can I be a part of this? How can I, you know, ensure that my country does, you know, all that is needed to be done to take advantage of these agreements and, you know, be part of this beautiful African vision that the African Union has presented in the form of the African continent and future area. So I'm just going to stop here and um, allow my colleagues to pick it up from me. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Ebiri. Um, you've raised so many points. You've raised uh, so many solutions. You've raised so many ideas. Um, I believe we've all listened attentively and possibly we have so many questions on our mind. So um, we'll just postpone that to the question and answer session. I myself also have a few questions. But we'll be giving the floor to our next mentor to carry on from here, Ms. Ezekiel Stop. Um, Amobola Adekola is our next mentor. You're welcome, and the floor is yours now. Hi, everyone. Can I, can, I, can you hear me, please? Just to be sure. Yes, so... I can hear you. Oh, okay, it sounds more cool. Let me remove my...
Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on board. That's JIIPC. I apologize. It's actually a very busy Saturday for me, but I had to sort of um, try to, to get this done. And thank you. Beriberi has done a wonderful job of um, getting us into the AFCFTA. And I was just going to speak to just the Great protocol because my belief that the Barry and my brother Tanatsu are they will do a fantastic job in handling the rest of it. But um just a quick one. So I um I'll just bypass all the history introduction. The Barry has done very well with that and she's been able to put us through. So um she mentioned that uh, sorry, I wasn't I wasn't available when they were doing the presentation. I just came right back in on that because I had to rush to do some things. But I'll just speak to the protocol, please. Um, just like Iberi mentioned, so there are the um, different protocols of the AFC the trade in goods, trade in services, uh, dispute resolution, intellectual property protection, the investment, the digital trade, and the women and youth are have just been released. So speaking to the digital trade protocol, um, I'm sure quite a lot of, lot of us, we've done a lot of e-commerce transactions, we've procured um, services or we've bought goods online. And there may be times and um, situations where they probably sold us something that is not what we are taught. You know, all those when you see what I ordered versus <laughs> what I got. Yeah, what I, what I I'm sure we've seen. <laughs> I'm it's sure we have seen a lot of that. So, what is the uh, that's really common? So, these are some of the things that the AFCFT, so the, the the AU, they try to come up with a digital pro trade protocol to guide the state parties. So, the state parties are all the members that have um, AFCFT. That's the fifty-four countries. About forty something of them have ratified it. Not all of them. But so, uh, so you'll be hearing me speak consistently about state parties. So it's meant to guide them in coming up with a digital trade policy, um, a continental one, just to enable and support trade within digital trade within our continent. Of course, we want to say, yes, there's the, there's the physical bits, there's the investment, we'll go, but a lot of us would probably be involved in between um, digital trade, trade and services. And so how do we ensure that there's safety? How do we ensure that we support that there's the enabling environment for us to be able to trade digitally without interruptions and we are safe and secure? We all know about um, cybersecurity incidents and all whatnot. So we need to ensure that. So let me just go right into it. So in the digital trade protocol, you mentioned that the, um, the policy is sort of based on the there is this strategy, the AU the digital tra tra transformation strategy for 2020 to 2030. That's where it's called. So that's what this is called. There's the digital transformation, there's the, the vision. So what do we intend to achieve by 2030, between now and 2030? And in coming up with the strategy under the AFCFT, we are looking at one of what it has, what is stated is that they are looking to build the African Union is looking to build a secure digital single market in Africa. By 2030, web free movement of persons, services, and capital will be ensured. And of course, individuals and businesses can seamlessly engage in online activities under the African continental free trade area. So right now, the protocol is out, but state parties are supposed to come up with um, strategies on how we are going to um, trade digitally and their the um, requirements in the protocol that state parties are supposed, are supposed to come up with rules of origin. For the people that are familiar with um, trading rules, I'm sure you probably have heard about the rules of origin. And so in, 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 in respect of digital as well, that has been come up um, for them. So what is the objective really? So of the digital trade protocol, you just basically let's have harmonized rules. Let me say harmonized, like rules that we're all collaborating Let's establish among us common rules and standards to enable and support digital trade. Because we, if we're saying that we want to trade online, we want to do online transactions, e-commerce under the AFCFT, just like Iberia explained what a free trade area is, we need to have harmonized. We need to have 
common rules and principles that would guide those transactions if you are doing any transaction under the AFCFT. And so that's one of the, um, the objectives. That's the main objective of the protocol. Let's create an enabling environment. Let's support our nationals. Let's support our businesses. Let's support SMEs. Let's support youths. So, and in coming up with that, the um, the protocol also provides for uh, the certain objectives that we need to also, uh, what are we going to do? We need to facilitate inter, um, intra-African trade by removing barriers. Of course, we all know that there will be barriers. There will be regulatory barriers. One country can say, oh, if you want to trade, these are the certain things you must do. This is what is required. And sometimes some of those things, they just cause unnecessary hindrances and they delay things and... Um, Sorry, just yes, they'll they'll delay things and things. You could have in respect of internet connectivity. You are trying to get a transaction done online and something pops it, and you know you are looking at we just facilitate it. Let's look at how to remove all these sort of barriers that remain that may hinder um a successful digital trade. Let's establish we let's have a transparent and secure digital trade ecosystem. That is very key. You don't want to. You know what? A lot of us. I'm sure some of us when we are trading, or like I have a card. I don't use all my bank cards to, to do transactions online. I have a card that I can put it up because I hardly, um, I hardly found it. When I found that card, that card is just to use to, I want to make a purchase and the money is taken out. So for me, so you want to, you want to create a safe system. You want to create a transparent system that people can be sure. Business, even businesses can be sure that if I pull my goods within this, because I'm fine. If I pull my products, everything is fine. There are no issues. Uh, there are no, but not doing to affect you. So we need to also cooperate. It's sort of to get states to cooperate. We need, we, we must, um, be conscious of the fact that there are different levels of development in Africa. There are some, the very developed ones. We have in South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, and there are some that, that has least developed. So in as much as we are trying to do all this, we all can, we all may not be able to meet our obligations. So that's sort of corporate. I'm trying to see how we can ensure that we are carrying everybody along. Any states that needs help, maybe facilities, infrastructure, technical cooperation, capacity building, other states that are well-developed or they are still developing can help us in that area. And also to promote safe, ethical, responsible and adoption and use of emerging technology. We all know the, the AI, all of it, they are all coming up, different things, innovations coming up every day. There has to be a guide. There has to be, a, uh, yes, even globally, even the AI and the rest of them. Yes, some of us are not lawyers here. There are still, there are different developments coming up every day, but we need to have a guide. If we're going to use it, we need to ensure that my data is safe online. We need to ensure that every activity that I'm doing online is safe and secure. In, in as much as so we need to come up with rules that would guide all these things. So on that, I'll just speak to maybe two or three um subtopics on that. So the first thing we're going to look at is that we look at facilitating digital digital trade colleges. So this um so apologies for that let me just put my phone inside. Okay. So what is um what are the things that what are the features of the digital trade protocol? It says um under facilitating digital trade, there needs to be electronic states have to provide the way electronic content authentication. We can't have yes, we want to have this digital trade. Most times, maybe laws are developing now. There maybe there used to be a certain time where you cannot um it has to be paper. Add copies or put a, you sign and all those sort of things. If you say it's electronic, it's not. It's not. It, it, there were times that those that wasn't accepted as um authenticating or that document. I know it has to be physical. It has to be. But now, what what the the the, the protocol has said. Let's have the, okay. Before I move to that, let me just just what are the scope the scope of the protocol? It doesn't apply to government procurement. So anything the government is doing, the digital trade protocol does not cover it. Information that is for for host state or done on behalf of host state doesn't cover it. So how do you um? Okay, so before I move to facilitation, I'm going to speak on treatments. Apologies, like sort of treatment of digital products. 
how are you meant to treat market access, digital products created by you? If you are in Nigeria, and I don't know if you have um, some of your members are across Africa, so you've created a digital product and you want to trade with it under the AFCFTA. How do you want another state party? Okay, if you are going to use it in Ghana or in Zimbabwe or in Morocco, how do you want it to be treated? You don't want it because, oh, because it's not, um, I'm not from Morocco. My product is now going to fall under some certain, yes, there are still national restrictions and regulations that there will be. But under the this AFCFT digital protocol, it says for that there should be no discrimination of digital products. The fact that so whatever treatment that is going to be accorded to my own digital product, whether from you're from Nigeria, if you are taking it to another country, the country must not treat you less favorable than it's going to treat you the digital products of let's say we are talking about Kenya now. The country shouldn't treat the digital product coming in from Nigeria less favorable than that that was produced or developed in Kenya. So I call them same treatments. That's what um, we're saying under the um, um, digital trade protocol. I call my own same treatment. I call the, own same, the same way you're treating digital products um, developed in Kenya. So also it says, um, if apart from the digital product, my maybe I'm the author, the performer, the producer, the developer, don't treat me less favorable because um, I'm from another country. If I'm the owner of the digital product, the same treatment that you apply to your own national treats me that way. That's what they say. It's just it's not accord less favorable to trying to digital products from another state party than it accords to like digital products from its territory on the basis that that person is from another state party. So what the FCS is trying to do, in, in as much as we all want to, yes, continental agreement, want to free trade, you know, that, there are challenges. We all know that about trust issues in Africa. And so if we want the AFCFC to be successful, there are things that need to be put in place. We are need, we need to get it right. So if you are going to say AFCFC and I'm taking my, somebody bringing their product to Nigeria and then they are now putting some, so yeah, there will be restrictions. No, but there, there are no doubts about that. There will be national restrictions. But as much as possible, ensure that whatever treatment you are according, it's not unfavorable. Treat products from other nationals similarly with the way they are treating your own nationals. But it doesn't also stop you. If you now say you want to enter maybe country A, Cote d'Ivoire wants to enter some sort of arrangement with Zambia, it doesn't stop them from entering some sort of favorable arrangement with each other. As long as that will not bring discrimination to other nationals of the AFCF, under the AFCFT. Fine, you can go ahead, you want to have some sort of agreement within yourself, just like there are regional economic communities. You want to have some sort of um agreement with um, yourselves. No, you don't want to, you don't want to stop that. You don't want to, nobody's stopping that, but at least treat everyone favorable. That's what it's saying. So we've moved um, to treatment now. Let's go to facilitate. Yes, we are saying treatment, but then we need to facilitate. We need to actually ensure. So how do we ensure that we can allow digital trade? How do we provide the environment? We are looking at electronic authentication. State parties are to adopt laws. They need to have laws that permit parties to an electronic transaction to determine the appropriate authentication methods. So if both of us are entering a transaction, I will say, oh, this is where we want to sign from here. If I'm signing my own copy here, if you're signing your own copy, we are using electronic signature. This, they need to put in laws. No, we shouldn't have laws that is now going to we, um, outright pull it, make that, make the authentication invalid. That's what um, they are saying. And also allow them to be able to prove before the courts or judicial authorities that the, um, the, this transaction, we have done it in respect, in line with um, laws and regulations. That's what it's basically saying. If you are going to facilitate it, paperless trade, you accept electronic versions of physical documents, of hard copies, trade documents. You know, you go to ports, they are signing this, they are signing that. It gets into it for digital trade. You need to accept um, uh, e-copies, e not necessarily not a paper copy. So that should make that transaction, that's legal, that's valid. It shouldn't render it invalid because it's not in hard copy. Then um, it also talks about contracts. Luckily for, for some of us that are lawyers, I think our own um, law of evidence is already, we've gone way past this. We've moved really... It's been updated and it's really too. We have um, electronic um, signature and the rest of them that are now allowed. The protocol also, I don't know, maybe there could be some 
countries in Africa that do not allow that here. So under electronic contract, we can allow the contract to be concluded by electronic means. It doesn't mean that we, we enter into a contract. We do agreement. I do agreement for clients. So some of them, are, they are outside the country. They are not in the same place. They now do a sign to make it run. We'll sign, they sign it electronically. Everybody shares a copy. Does it doesn't mean does it render that agreement in, uh, in value? No. We that's in Nigeria. There are ways under our evidence act that you can prove it because as long as you follow the required regulations in respect of authenticating even the electronic document, that's fine. So our evidence act is we we I think Nigeria, we are we are already updated in respect of this. So it also says do not deny the legal effects, enforceability, and validity of electronic contract. Speaks to electronic invoicing, but we'll just move. Digital payments. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the fintech. Well, some of us that may want to go into the fintech space already. There are quite a number of them um, with them. Flutterwave, Paystack, and the rest of them already happening. So it also says that you should enhance access to and participation in digital trade through the promotion of uh, between their respective digital payment and settlement systems. And there's a, under the AFCFT, there's, I will speak to it later, the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System. That's the, how payments transactions will be concluded under the AFCFT. So uh, for you, Nigel, I'm sure a lot of us know now there are issues of dollars, dollarization, and or you want to make transaction is being converted dollar. But under the AFCFT, that's not the way it's done. If you are buying a product and the buyer, with the buyer, you are from Nigeria and the seller is in Ghana. You pay in Naira and the seller receives in CD, Ghanaian CD. That's the way the transaction will be done. Whatever that is going to be done at the pocket with the transaction, that's fine, but it's not going to be oh, based on this, this dollar, this and that. You are doing, carrying, conducting the transactions with your local currency under the AFCFT, that's the Pan African Payment and Settlement System. And there's also the provision for digital payment under the protocol. You know, we can say, oh, that's already happening, but that still needs to be provided for in the protocol. Everybody needs to know that this uh, this is available. The state needs to support affordable real-time saving. must be safe and secure. I don't want to make payment and somebody is um, putting it better into my, my details, my data, my, my laptop or some sort of bug or... I go to a site and, you know, it must be universally accessible cross-border digital payment and settlement systems. And in doing that, yes, we are saying the continent is Africa. We need to also adopt their international regulations, international standards for all these things that have been set down. There are international standards and in the state, in coming up with policies, in coming up with their with the digital trade protocol policies that the under after, all these things need to be taken into consideration. Okay, and I will just quickly move to data governance. I think this is one place that will be of concern to a whole lot of us. Cross-border data transfers. We are transferring our data now across the border. You know, in Nigeria, we have the, the data protection regulations. We have our laws guiding our data is to be processed. So if you are somebody, I, do, I know most of you are probably students, so I don't know whether there are coppers here. Some of you are probably already selling products online you have your products on instagram instagram and the rest of them but there are there are ways that when you're collecting there are ways that you are meant to treat those information that you are collecting you might think that oh the person is just putting name and address and phone number there are ways that you are meant to treat it that the law requires you to and if you breach it if you if you treat it outside of law you are, you are in breach and you can get penalized because of that so in respect of treating personal data, your phone number, email, my address, all the sort of um, sort of things that you need, there are ways that they look. So in this instance, so we are going to be moving data across board among 54 countries. You want to ensure that in as much as, um, yes, we are saying we want to facilitate digital trade, there must be, gui there must be guidance, there must be a way that this, is, um, this, uh, this needs to be done. There has to be standards, there has to be rules governing this um, data transfers. And it says, yes, the state parties are subject, there's an annex, uh, annex on cross border, they allow cross border transfer, including personal data by letter, provided the activity is for the conduct of digital trade. So under this, you can only use transfer data based for, dig for digital trade transactions, you can't use it for any other purpose. If you go there, the 
um what's this eu what do they call their own um this um, data protection regulation there's a way that if you are going to be treating data of eu eu person or eu resident there's a way you must treat that whether if you even if you think the person is the nigerian there's a way that is uh, required for you to treat data of their nationals or the residents so you can't treat it just anyhow so this one i said it just basically for digital trade you can't use that data for any other things so the state has to come up with measures and all the sort of thing. How do then how do you protect personal data? They need to provide a legal framework that provide that um, just like I said, protect data of people that are engaged in digital digital trade. Come up with legal framework and the rest of it. So publish regulations that that guide digital trade. So and then another thing else again, location of computing facilities. State facilities are not meant to say oh because. Um, you want to do digital trade, Michael, you must use a computer facility that is in my country. No, don't do, they shouldn't bring up such restrictions. We much more as uh, we are trying to protect that. We don't bring up restrictions that are going to hinder um, the successful facilitation of the trade. Please let me know if I'm running out of time so that I just don't extend it. So it says that state parties shall not require a person of another state party to use or locate computing facilities in that as a condition. No, that's not allowed. We can't um we can't stop that. Then what is business and consumer trust, which I've been emphasizing on a lot. So um you can't say the um, source code that the person, the developer of the source code, because it wants to import maybe software into your own territory. Somebody Cameroon cannot say because somebody in Code Deva wants to import or distribute the software because they must um, release the software. No, that's the IP of the developer. You can't tell the person to release that source code as a condition for import or distribution or sale of that software in Cameroon. No, it's not allowed. However, for lawyers know this, there will always be, for every there's an exception. And what do I mean by exception? In as much as we are saying, you can't tell the developer to release his intellectual property, that the source could the doc documentation that he used to do to develop that software. That's his intellectual, but that's a private thing. But there are still times that the, the countries can actually require that. That is when maybe the um, a judicial authority or a government, they, they need to investigate. Maybe there's been a breach or something. They can uh, tell you to release that source code. They want to carry out an investigation inspection, audits, and all that's allowed in such situation. So you can do that. Then cybersecurity, that's a, a major thing. So I'm just trying to like look at, look at, I try to focus on, let you know that this is all this um, provision that's being provided for under the protocol. You need to adopt measures to ensure cybersecurity. You don't want to go to a site and you're, you put on your laptop and <laughs> they wipe out your data or your details. So they need to ensure that because measures are there to prevent, to combat cyber crime and all whatnot. And they are to train, training for the government officials or regulatory authorities, whether they are going to be handling all this, they need to also be aware. You know, training is very key. So that's why some foreign organizations, we have them, ACA, they, they always come in to do some sort of capacity building. Or in as much as you have the AFCFT, there are still challenges, maybe funding challenges and all. So there could be, there needs to be some straining to government officials. I'm sorry, I hope there's no government available. There are some of them that, you know, when you're interacting there, you can see, of course, the weaknesses of some of the challenges. But so they need to be, they need to build the capacity. You know, Eberi mentioned the other time that some customs authority, they don't know tariffs and all those. Things. Yes, because... They need to keep training them to know some of them. Some of them are not even aware. Some of them, they don't even know what the FCFT is about. So if you are saying you want to have all this, you need to train them to know. Then, of course, the states are to cooperate, cooperate in all these things. Let everybody carry on. There are some people, some states might not be able to, that's some country, that if I say state, they might not be able to adopt some measures early because of development issues. But some will, you know, at each level that you can, um, then you um then you you start putting things then internet access is very key a lot of us we are aware that sometimes you want to use the internet and it's gone maybe you are shopping something happens your money's gone you can't see your channel the state needs to ensure so that this is going to be in respect of services providers that are they're providing us internet service. They need to provide top top notch service if we are going to do all this. And of course, states to allow you, you can decide. They shouldn't restrict that. Oh, you must use this internet. No, pick an internet provider of your choice. 
subject to a reasonable, transparent, and non-discriminatory network management. That's fine. Then finally, I'll just speak to online consumer protection. There should, there should be laws that for a bit misleading, fraudulence, and deceptive commercial activity. I'm sure a lot of us are scammers online. They'll come and, okay, I've spoken about what I ordered versus what I got, making false misrepresentations or false claims as to material qualities. It's broken it down. Prices, suitability for purpose, quantity or origin. No, you can't. You have to be, you have to be forthright. Everything, information must be complete. Advertising goods without intention to supply. Failing, failing to deliver products or provide services to consumers after the payment uh, payment has been made, then charging or debiting customers' financial or other accounts. You know, a lot of us and um, all this. Thing. So but all in as much as this is all stated there, you know, we need to have our regulatory authorities who are very effective. Um, I'm not, uh, we had one of uh, the Federal Co uh, Competition Commission, Consumer Protection, who was very, very, who's done a really great job when consumers protect that. I'm not going to mention names here. And, you know, people complain and they go and they go out there and sometimes they still maybe do some of those stores or some of them, you can make complaints. And we have sometimes, I see Instagram, there's a provision for that in the agreement where you say people cannot say, uh, refund there's no, no refund especially instagram sellers if you are if, if i don't know if you had about all this sort of things like actually against the law and it's stated here clearly they've got the step on that to ensure they have a right to return and refund if you are, if i i that's i always find this trade in nigeria where i was in the uk if you buy something and it's not you can still take it back after some days and say oh yes i want to return this i don't think it's fit for what i want and they'll take it back but instagram seller but they'll tell you hey, because they don't want people to also take advantage of this but it's not right under the law for you to say no refund no exchange no you know all those sort of things that they put online so take part of that to ensure that the customers have the right to return and refund including the right to return the goods that are unsafe, defective, or fit for purpose, and the rest of them. So I will just stop here a bit. So it makes provision for financial technology, SMEs, emerging techs, and we can't finish the discussion today. That's the truth. So those are sort of the things that the protocol is seeking to look at. And just to share a bit of the, our digital transformation strategy, a for so it's a, what are they looking at? They've identified some strengths, weaknesses, opportunities under that sort. Okay, they said, yes, on that strength, the momentum is gaining for digital strategy for Africa. We can see it, especially with FinTech. Most AU member states have developed IT, ICT policies and there's a mobile phone availability and it's becoming more affordable. We can see that even in the rural area, yeah, all that is there. Weakness. They said there's weak coordination among continental institutions. That means our regulatory agencies in different countries they are not coordinated. So these are the areas that they need to look at. How are they coordinated so that they will come up with harmonized rules and regulations? So those are sort of things that they also need to work on. There's also the weakness of weak frame of mechanism for monitoring and evaluating implementation of the strategy. Those are some of the challenges that we have. What are the opportunities? There's a space to establish continental coordination framework for digital agenda for Africa, all of that, opportunities for digital transfer to revolutionize the African financial sector. I think we are getting there with that. We have not gotten to where we are, but we'll get there. And the threats, of course, the weak coordination makes it difficult. The limited supervisory capacity to identify and mitigate risk. Oh, the gender gap, the mobile asset. Remember, I am um, very spoke about the women and youth protocol, and that is one area that they need to bring up women and youth, especially women, to train. There's also digital training strategy in the protocol. You need to train people on how to use the internet, um, do transactions via e commerce, and the rest of them. So, I will just stop here for a bit so that um, my brother Tanatsuwa can. And in his own bit of it. Thank you very much, everyone. Apologies that I had to turn off the video. I was distracted me a bit with this. Stuff. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, we should be thanking you, Miss Mobola Adekola, for that very, very um, insightful and um, packed with a lot of information um, session you just gave us. Um, like just like you said, um, the AFCFT is a very, very broad field, and we cannot discuss everything about it just today. I mean, just look at our first mentor, Miss Ibiri. She took um 
the history and uh, she gave us so many informations and you just focused on the digital trade protocol and you've been on and on and um, I believe uh, Mr. Tanasiwa would also take another area and enlighten us more. So um, just a quick um, a quick contribution before we call on Mr. Tanatsiwa. Um, I believe um, all our mentees are on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. You can search for our mentors' profiles. They have uh, their newsletters, they have their, their groups, they have pages, they, they post so many articles. Um, Ms. Omobola, that I just finished to, uh, speaking, she has a podcast on the topic and uh, you can learn so much more even after the session. So that being said, I would be calling on Mr. Tanasiwa to um, take on his own session now. Thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, Mr. Tanasiwa, are you still on the call with us? Oh, I can't see Tanasiwa. I think he's he's not on the call. All right. While we are waiting for Mr. Tanasiwa, quickly we can do uh, the picture session for now. I encourage everyone to turn on your video. You know the jury. Thank you very much as you do so. Yeah, thank you. Please, everyone, let's turn on our video. We normally take pictures for our social media posts. We smile on those pictures um, because we are so happy to be here and we are so happy to, to learn together on this platform. Okay. All right, I've taken a screenshot so we can move on. Is Ms. Mr. Tanasiwa on the call? I don't think he is. So while we are waiting for him, um, I would encourage everyone, I, I believe we all have questions so far from um, the uh, Boot Mentors talk on the topic. I believe we all have questions. So um, there's the question and answer session. You are encouraged to send in your question as to the chat box or raise your hand um, to ask your question. I will just call on you as soon as I see your hand raised. Um, I'm still expecting more questions, questions from our mentees, but I will quickly um be asking a question to our first mentor, Ms. Iberi. You talked about um contribution to uh, one of the, the 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 objectives of the AFCFTA is to improve the um contribution to like movement of persons across border. I would like you to um to give us shed more light on that and um tell us 
what's what's um what are they doing currently? What is the protocol doing currently um with regards to movement of persons across border? Um especially with um the visa uh, the visa issues. All right, thank you. Do I need to turn on my video? I can speak, right? Yes. Okay, so, yeah, one of the objectives of the AFCFT that I mentioned earlier is to promote free movement of capital and persons. And, um, you know, you your question was what is being done currently? In that regard, yes. what is being done currently is just on a country level basis. So we've seen some African countries, you know, take initiatives that um, these are uh, um, policies and initiatives just to you know um, promote movement of persons in Africa. So I know Rwanda is one of those countries that is very open. Um, Kenya, well. Kenya an announced that um, they were going to eliminate visa, um, visa you know, policies and all, but they introduced something else that almost looked like, you know, looked like the same thing they were trying to avoid. So I don't know what they intend to achieve with that. But so far, like I said, it's, it's a country that will be at the same few countries do that, being open to the whole entire Africa. I'm not talking about your regional economic blocks. For blocks, it's, it's quite easy. In ECOWAS, um, we see that it's easy to move from across continent West Africa. I mean, what are the experience personally? Nobody's asking for. I don't, I don't need to apply for any visa. Uh, nobody's asking me for any, you know, Visa, all I need is my my passport, and I just show them, you know, as if you're doing Europe, if you're doing um, cross border, you have to stop at different visas. For that, it's it's quite easy because everyone you don't have a couple of and when it comes to many of us for their countries, it also I'm sorry, I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if you can all hear me, Severi. Her network is breaking. Oh, she's off the call. I think oh, she that's... was having... Can we hear her, please? Hi, can anyone hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, so I'm about um, the general economic community, as the South African development community, the commerce that is common matter of Eastern and African, you know, countries. They they have sort of mentioned, you know, the South African community, the Arab guys, you know, these smaller, smaller blocks in North Africa, South Africa, East and West Africa have achieved that sort of integration. When it comes to the moment of persons, but what we're talking about is the continental level of integration. I can go to South Africa, for instance, and maybe I have easier, you know, friendly visa policies, like maybe visa on arrival, for instance. Some countries are implementing this for, you know, other countries, but we do not yet see that openness. Many countries, and um, the the openness we have in they start where countries decide to take it, take the AU um, protocol on free movement seriously and decide that, oh, as I am pushing for the AFTA, the free children, the AFTA only do so much. You should work in the AU protocol. I have a protocol that AFTA So as we are pushing for the ratification and the implementation of ACF.
Hello everyone, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry, my network my network was down and um, I was off the call for a moment. I didn't get um to when uh, Miss Ebere finished answering the question. Uh, Miss Ebere, are you still on the call? Yeah, I was. Okay, I thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Are you done answering the question? Okay. Hello? No, you I, I was just rounding up that. What? I said I was rounding up. So, like I said, we just have few countries that, that have um, eliminated the need of visa requirement for African countries to Rwanda and Gambia, Seychelles, and one other country in West Africa that then is public, even in public. Yeah. And the, it, it's still a, why we want to like the latest to join them. So far, it's still, it's still small because like 54 African countries and they're still doing this push, you know, to keep advocates of the person to be Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm done. I, I believe okay, I've okay. answered your question. Yes, yes, ma'am, you have. Thank you very much. I'm still um awaiting our mentees' questions for um those of us that have questions, please send in your question or just ask on the chat box. So I have um should I say two questions for uh, Miss Omobola? I, I still can't find Mr. Tanasiwa on the call with us. I was informed that he was on the call earlier, but I think he, he dropped off. So um, for Miss Omobola, the, my first question is that um, with regards to um, the PowerPoint presentation from one of the mentee that presented, um, he mentioned that one of the the challenges the LCFT are facing currently is um, the corruption and uh, among uh, different countries. So I want you to to share more light on how how the what the FTA is doing to to curb this corruption. And secondly, um, while you are you are presenting, you mentioned at first that um, there is a problem of what I versus what I got. And um, um, towards the end of your, your talk, if someone wants to hide in the problem, please kindly mute yourself if you're not talking. Alama <laughs> Bawa. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh my God. So, my, uh, I hope you're following me, Miss Omobola. I, I only got the first one, the um, corruption. Okay, um, yeah, this, this second question is um, you, you mentioned um, earlier about what I ordered versus what I got. And um, before you ended your, your talk, you also mentioned um, the being um, um, treating um, it, every other country and every other producer from every other country fairly the way you you treat your your own um, your own national um, that you're buying from so um what is the ESCS doing with regards to the quality standard of um of like the products that are being traded um between countries um okay thank you very much but i'm guessing well your question all this relates to policy, internal government, government issues, political will. Corruption, is that really what um, all of us can do about it? It's for each country to be putting in steps based on um, guidelines from AFCFTA as to how to put in appropriate structures and policies in place. For example, at the port, some of the countries are already digitizing their ports. So you're already using um, e-copies, trying to clear your products through digital. You know, that, that will also help in a bit as it was supposed to present in paper copies and you have officials that are asking you for this and that some countries have already taken that step. And we believe that that is one area 
that they are also um, trying to get rid of. And also state parties are also encouraged to put out information, available information, transparent information online in respect of their rules, regulations, and guidelines. So that if you want to import to a country or you want to export to another, you can see if some sort of no, uh, somebody is going to have this is what it is. You can also get it avail uh, easily available by going to whatever, maybe the websites or the online portal that state parties have made available to get, okay, these are the regulations we require. These are standards we can, these are the information for you to be able to do this. Those are some of the areas that have been encouraged. That is not all fully available yet. But that those are part of things that have been encouraged that state parties should put in place as well. Then also the um the trade portal for the AFCFT itself. It's called um sorry, I've just gotten the name off me now. That people whatever whatever challenges that they experience at different countries at different ports, you can go on the it's a trade portal. You can go and put all those information there. If you're experiencing barriers, if you're experiencing challenges, put it all put all those information via the AFCFTA portal so that that can also be addressed and monitored. So that's so those are some of the steps that have been taken. And of course, you know the political will. If this party, if the country, if the, each party, the government, they are really ready and available to work on this, then everybody knows that, of course, it's not business as usual. But without that, but with some of these um, steps that have been encouraged by the AFCFC, we believe, um, yes, we take steps to eliminate some form of corruption and all. Then when I talked about um, no less favorable treatment from different um, state parties, you can see that uh, what the state is saying in respect of software, the, in respect of digital product, don't treat my another national of another country less favorable than the way you would treat your own that is what the law says in coming up with this policy they are still the state parties are still supposed to come up with a policy on this anyway this is a guideline and these are things that they so in the process of coming up with all their rules of origin all their policies they are, they are they i'm sure there will be provisions for how these things can be monitored and how you can make a complaint where you have issues like that so there will be all these provisions. Those are some of those. These are the um, issues that are going to be addressed in coming up with the policy, the continental digital trade policy under AFCFTA. All right. I hope I'm uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm okay. And um, um, while I'm very disappointed, I haven't gotten any question from our mentees on the call yet. We have over sixty mentees and. No one is asking any question. Um, to my own understanding, I believe um, they all understood um, everything um, so perfectly. Okay, sorry, just to add the one portal that I was talking about the FCFT, the, um, that I said that there's um, a way that you can go and impute information. So there's an African trade um, observatory, it's called African Trade Observatory, a trade information portal where you get information about trade, access, regulatory requirement, challenges, or even barriers from different states. That information will be put on that um, African Trade Observatory portal. So just to add that to it. Thank you. Hello, I can't hear anything again. I don't know if that's from my end. Hello. I think the, the host has been logged out. 
Okay. Uh, okay, maybe when it gets in, sorry, I may I need to run this. I need to. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, my network went off. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I hope we still have our mentors on the call. I have one more question. One last question for our both mentors. So um just like our mentees presentation stated and also our mentors confirmed that um 54 countries have signed the AFCFTA agreement, but not all the 54 countries have rectified the agreement. I want to ask a question to our both mentors that why uh, why are those countries that haven't rectified the agreement? Why are they haven't they rectified their agreement? And what is the union doing to penalize? Because I don't see a reason why you would sign but you will not rectify. So why have the union open what is the union doing to penalize? Because me I am of the movement of if you are interested you should you should do it fast and you should just just do it you shouldn't be um, dragging it down so that it it would help the union um, reach its its goals and uh, its objective as fast as possible so what what is the union doing um miss Ebiru can go first okay when you said penalize, I smiled <laughs> because this is the international law and um, you know, a lot of things work with diplomacy. I'm not sure, but it took time. It took time when like one of the last sets of countries to ratify it. Not, it well, I mean, to ratify before it came into force, but we we delayed ratification. It wasn't immediately for us. And one of the things um the then president said was well, they had to you know consider stakeholders' interests of different associations, you know, just to be sure that. This I don't know if I'm the only one, but your voice is breaking so much that I can't get your answer. And currently, I can't even hear you at all. So please, uh, Mentee, if you can just indicate on the chat box if you can hear her. Maybe it's my network, but I can't hear her at all. Okay, Ma, I think it's general and maybe it's Miss Iberi's network. So Miss Iberi, if you can hear me, um, you should know that we can't hear you. So um, I'll be calling on Miss I'm about to take on the question Why we are waiting for Ms. Iberi to... Okay, um, I'll just quickly answer that then. I would need to run off. Just like Iberi said, it's um this uh, international laws that you are dealing with. You cannot penalize anyone. There are different um steps in different countries in respect of when it comes to all these treaties and laws, international laws and all. And so, just as she was explaining, Nigeria also took its time in ratifying, and that's not even the final state. They still do other stage of domesticating it into our laws in Nigeria here. But the ratification is that most a lot of countries have ratified and yes, they can deal with it with other countries. But internally as well, we need but it takes a whole lot. There are stakeholders discussions. They are looking at quite a number of things within their countries. Are we ready? What are the things that need to be put in place? Are we because in Nigeria too took its time because 
some people yes you will not people express fears they don't want you don't want nigeria to become a dumping ground so you are looking at it what it, well, how is it going to affect different stakeholders is this something that we should get onto are we ready for it and you know there are different meetings with different to the business environment everyone looking at the manufacturers association different associations different business associations before the government then ratified it and so we must understand that all these things need to be considered it's a free trade agreement it's a, a relationship with the parties that they, they've had issues of trust over the years. We still have this. Somebody has mentioned them, all the other regional trade agreements that are still in place. We have issues that we've signed different ones that they are not fully effective. So, you know, but just what I would advise that person, let's be positive. They are taking steps in finding a way to get this to their also so forth, which is why we have the guided trade initiative. You know, Iberia mentioned it, that the secretariat is monitoring to just the most supervising to see just to test the effectiveness of the AFCS. And in the process of testing, they are looking at the weaknesses and the strengths. What are the things that need to be put in place so that implementation can be effective? So in the process of testing it, how many countries have participated? Started they started with eight more countries have joined. Nigeria wants to join the next phase. But you also want to look at it. You want to test it that um this is going to work. And in the process of testing, what are the, you know, she mentioned about some customs, they didn't even know what the tariff rate should apply on the goods. Those are the things that you need to start putting in place, that awareness, information, that you need to provide this on that. You know, this is a test phase. Let's look at all the things, um, the problems that may arise and how do we put um, solutions in place so that when AFCFT is fully implemented, we will say that, oh, we might not have achieved it 100%, but we've been able to get to a stage that yes, we are able to address some barriers that, that that seem easy that shouldn't even be disturbing us in the first place. So that is what some of the yes, nobody is saying that all the other ones are. We know there are challenges, but there is this like okay, let's see what can we come up with here. So let's also get Africa to this stage within global trade. Let's see what we can do as well. But in the process, so that's why there is a secretariat. That is based in Ghana. We have the AFCFTA Secretary General, Wam Kele Mene. So I'm sure a lot of so those are the things, and they are trying to like go to different also to support the implementation. So each country has its own implementation strategy. Nigeria their own. This is how we are going to implement it in Nigeria. Ghana has its own. Okay, a lot of countries they have it. And remember, I said African countries are different stages of development. So some there. So even in the process of implementation, some have been given more years. Extended years than the other days. I think for least developed, it has just 10 years in respect of taking out tariffs on in respect of goods in, for rules of origin and preferential treatment. You know, those are sort of things you are looking at. Then we have as challenges infrastructure. Af um, Africa, we are moving, we are at a place of we are exporting raw materials. What the AFCFT is trying to well, one main thing of the AFCFT we want to move to value addition. There's going to be industrialization. All this is going to take a lot. We, we have infrastructural transportation challenges. So, you know, it is in the process of discussion, negotiations. They are looking at how do we address this? How do we have in, in country wise? Each country, the, the, the situation, what is um, peculiar to Nigeria is different from another country. So, for some of them, so they are taking, there's not like, even for us to get, I think, 47 at once, very soon you may hear that another one has ratified. So there are internal consultations going on as well. They need to also consult with stakeholders. They need to look at how it's going to affect their own nationals. You, have, you want to protect your own nationals in as much as you are concerned, oh, we want AFCFT. But your concern is, I, my, the businesses in my country, the government is like, oh, is it going to be affected? Well, Nigeria, you're looking at you don't want Nigeria to come and become a Nigeria is a huge market, and everyone is looking at that. You don't want Nigeria to come and become a dumping ground, but at the expense of your own businesses, SMEs, and all that. So those are things that they are putting issues that have been considered. So we should just give it time. We cannot enforce anyone. It is, it is international. We all have their sovereignty. They can decide to opt out. I don't know what time. Um, it's called a free trade agreement. And when they are ready, and each country is ready, after all, out of 55, the only 54 that is signed on to the AFCFTA. There's one country that is not. So they decided that no, they are not interested. So that's just what I would just say. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Gray is still on the call. And um, it's 
ask her if she has any contribution to make before we um wrap up the session for today. I can see that. Um, it's a very, I join very back key. where. Yeah, when um, Mobola was talking, and yeah, and I and I think she has some um, she has had a question. I'll just give an example of the WTO agreement on um, fisheries. So that was um in twenty twenty two the WTO had Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Oh. Um, she's not even on the call anymore because her network is very bad. So um, with this, we've come to the end of the session for today's um, program on AFCFTA. I do hope that we all enjoyed the session. Um, we learned something new. Um, it spurs our uh, enthusiasm to um to learn more about EFCFTA and um our responsibilities, just as Ms. Um Iberi said earlier, and um, what we should be doing domestically um to help EFCFTA enforce uh, the policies and um the goal of the union. Okay. Okay. Uh, this Everyone's network is really, really bad. And uh, we still don't have any question from our mentees. So thank you very much once again, Ms. Ebiri and also Ms. Omobola for the wonderful session today and for for um, making the spare time to be with us today. Um have a lovely and wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you and very much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir.